year was 1996. I took a yoga class in Los Angeles with a friend, and it was this was before yoga was the multi-billion dollar industry that it is now. It was people in leotards with incense sticks chanting. But this class was the most incredible physical experience and it was profoundly spiritually awakening. And my friend and I said, hey, yoga's gonna take off. I mean, if you haven't tried it, it's gonna blow your mind. So we moved to a place where there was no yoga, Phoenix, Arizona, or very little yoga. And we opened a chain, the first chain of boutique yoga studios. And the idea was we threw all the rules, all the tradition out the window. We advertised on the billboards. We invited the news crew into our studio to do their morning live shot. We cranked up the hip hop music and we made yoga fun. Well, I think the more you do yoga, the more you, it's less about your body and it's more about the philosophy of being at one and being connected and focusing on what unites you with somebody else instead of what makes you different. I think we, our culture is so focused on how you can be better, how you can be separate, how you can like be an individual. But ultimately the real power is in the connection that you feel with others. I and mean, if you took a strand of DNA from any two people in the world, it's 99.9% .9 the same. But we tend to focus on that 0.1%. And there's not, there's not real lasting sustainable power and in, in difference. I think it's in what brings you together. That's where the juice is. My, what I learned was that it was the gurus were trying to teach people how to sit in meditation for prolonged periods and you need to have a sense of physical comfort in order to sit. So yoga prepares you to have that deep meditation. So funny, there's a story I, I saw, um, the Washington Post did an experiment and they took a famous violinist named Joshua Bell and they disguised him as a street musician and they put him in a Washington DC subway stop during rush hour and they wanted to see if people would stop and listen to this amazingly famous, talented violinist. So over the course of an hour, over a thousand people raced by on the way to the subway and only seven people stopped. And so the next day, well, if you watch the video, everyone's like basically running around like a chicken with their head cut off, just stressed to get to the subway. and. They talk about the article the next day, the Hopi Indians had a word in Hopi Indian culture. If somebody was running around like a chicken with their head cut off, they were said to have a disease called Konyana Skatsi. And it meant like life out of balance. And to heal that person, you'd be sent to the medicine man and reconnected to the rhyme and, and rhythm of the earth. The Hopis had a saying, don't live on the earth, live with the earth. And now everybody has that disease. It's a, it's a disease, we call it stress, we call it anxiety, and we say that's it's normal, but it's not normal, it is a disease. And so the best thing we can do before you try to go down all these other paths is to just take a moment to get reconnected to the rhyme and rhythm of the earth. If you start your day, <coughs> start your day with a few deep breaths. Start your day before you dive right into email with a moment of silence. Finish your day with a few deep breaths. Finish your day instead of reading about all the crazy things going on. You know, if you finish your day watching the Game of Thrones and see someone get their head sliced off and then you try to go to sleep, it's no wonder that you're gonna wake up stressed out. But if you finish your day with a moment of silence, a moment of prayer, um, just a moment of relaxation, it makes a huge difference. So it's the, the foundation of just being reconnected to the basics. It's so ironic that the guy that invented the iPhone had he wouldn't let his kids look at their iPad I don't think I don't think Steve Jobs let his kids look at iPad look at the iPad and the average human being now looks at a screen eight hours a day and I saw something the other day that said that a working parent with a small child at home spends more time each day deleting email than reading to their child which makes perfect sense that's the world that we live in now we're distracted and what's interesting is the first thing we do when we're in the midst of an important moment is we take out our phone and we record it as a video or a photo, a social media post. And what I've taught in my workshops all these years is that our greatest moments and our greatest memories are that which are associated with our senses. So the smells and the tastes and the sounds. Uh, there's a story I tell like smell is the most powerful of all the senses because smell is the only one of your senses to trigger a feeling 
before it triggers a thought. So scent-oriented memories can really move you. So for me, it's Dracar Noir cologne, because when I was a kid, all the guys wore Dracar Noir because you thought it would help your chances in getting a date. So I had this date before my 10th grade semi-formal, this valley girl named Kim with a huge hairdo. And so I loaded up on Dracar Noir cologne, and whenever I smell Dracar Noir now, it brings me back to 1989 getting out of the limo, and I felt the nervous butterflies going to pick up my date with giant hair. But no Instagram photo could trigger a memory like that. So I always encourage my students when you're in the midst of something meaningful with your kids, with, in nature, with your friends, before you take out your phone and capture it on, on your phone, get down on your hands and knees. What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like? Make it a part of you before you make it a part of your phone. I think, because I think it, it's the social media thing is starting to get where, to this point where you think it's an important part of your business, that you, the more likes you get on your photos and everything's a chance to grow your business and to grow your personal brand. And everyone has a personal brand. But I think there's a bubble there that's gonna pop eventually. I don't think that you can sustain all the social media that everyone's focused on right now. It's just too much. Yeah, and I think it's also part of the family dynamic because I have a 15-month-old at home, 18-month-old at home, and he sees mommy and daddy on their phones, and so he wants to use the phone. And it's like, how do you break that habit of constantly needing to look at your screen? we need to start a conversation about that in our society you know about using the phone less and having more human experiences but especially with, with children you know because children see us and there's a saying that children don't need your presence p-r-e-s-e-n-t-s -E -E they need your presence p-r-e-s-e-n-c-e -E. they don't make an app on your phone to replicate touch taste smell and we need love i mean everybody needs love in their life. And I don't think you can get real love from your mobile device and your emails. And you know, I don't think love is a digital experience as much as we'd like to think it is. The love is based on touch. Um, I did this experiment where I run around New York City with a film crew and I got to give you a one minute hug. So we captured it on film and if New Yorkers would let me wrap my arms around you for one minute. And it was so awkward because touch is so rare in our culture. I mean, we'll go a long time without physical touch. I mean, people will go weeks, sometimes months, without loving physical touch. And I mean, if you haven't been touched in a while and then you have a loving touch, I mean, you could just die. It feels so wonderful. And babies need touch to survive, but adults need touch to thrive. And that's not really part of our culture. I mean, if you went into Starbucks and there was a stressed out person in front of you and you started giving them a little shoulder rub, that would be so weird, right? There was this psychologist, I think his name was Sidney Girard, he did an experiment and he went to cafes all over the world to study different cultures' relationship with touch. And two people sitting in a cafe in England didn't touch each other a single time. In America, it was only once or twice. In Puerto Rico, it was the highest in the world. It was 180 touches in an hour. But it's so rare. I was in India on a yoga retreat and it's very common for men to hold hands in India regardless of your sexual orientation. You go watch the soccer game at the bar and walk home with your buddy and you hold hands. And being a touchy-feely yoga guy, I got back to LA and I was watching the basketball game with my friend and it was a really tense timeout and I just reached over to hold his hand. He hated it. Touch is so freaky and taboo and weird. And I think that you say community, just touch is enough to heal us and bring us back together. It's not like you need to go to the ends of the earth and have this profound spiritual awakening. Just have a one minute hug or dedicate one minute each day to love. And that's all it takes to reconnect and reform those bonds. I mean, fear, we go to far greater lengths to avoid what we fear than to do what we love. That's a quote, I didn't make that up. But it's very common, I think, that we succumb to our fear. Uh, the acronym for fear is forget everything and run. There's so much fear. Uh, there's so many kinds of fear. There's scientific names. There's fear of beards, paganophobia, 
fear of spiders, everyone knows arachnophobia. There was, I saw there was fear of in-laws. There's a million kinds of fears. Everybody's afraid of something. And the acronym for fear is forget everything and run. And I think we're always on the run. We're always being chased by our doubts, by our fears. And just to take a moment to stop. If we could take a moment to stop, we would recognize that we're more powerful than our fear. We can rise up against our fear. But if you're always on the run, that, that's just the never ending cycle. I think fear plays an important role, but it gets out of control and the media obviously feeds our fears. And you know, so we hear so much about mindfulness and the biggest thing about mindfulness is that you have the power to extract your attention from something that's not serving you. But if you don't have a mindfulness practice, then we're always paying attention to that which makes us afraid. The, the news, the magazines, the TV, conversations we have at work, everything feeds our fears. So until we break that cycle and ex learn how to shift our attention to that which makes us feel more love, we're gonna feel more fear. I think it's important to be able to express to somebody when you're afraid and talk about it, have a conversation about it, because when we keep things to ourselves, that's when it calcifies and we think it becomes who we are. And it's not who we are, but it's important to express and talk about it openly and honestly. It's a part of you that's an attachment to everything that you think you need. One of my favorite quotes is, uh, thinking you need something that you don't already have is a form of insanity. And I think we all attach to things that we think we need. Everything's conditional. So we say things to ourselves like, I'll be happy when I'm in better shape. I'll be happy when it's the weekend. I'll be happy when I get my kids through school. And I found, I've done a lot of work with older people. And most older people are either really worried or really resentful. And you know what happens is that if you're a little bit worried when you're 30 or 40 or 50, you're gonna be really worried when you're 60, 70, 80. If you're a little bit resentful when you're 15, 25, 35, you'll be really resentful when you're 45, 65, 85. And there's some old people that I've met that are really happy. And I think at a certain point, you have to bust through all those conditions and be happy now, be grateful now. And that's, uh, that's tricky. It's like awakening to the moment you're in, that this is the best moment. Maybe not the happiest moment, but the moment when you're most alive. It's wrapping your arms around life instead of pushing life away. I think it's very common. I had this experience where I went whitewater rafting in Alaska and it was really dangerous and the guide warned us said something really interesting. He said, if you duck, cower, and hide in the face of the rapids, the pressure of the rapids is gonna suck you right out. You're probably gonna go into hypothermia. There was bears all along the sides of the river. So he said, you don't wanna duck, cower, and hide. You wanna stick your paddle in, and you wanna row like hell, and that'll give you leverage, and you'll stay in the raft. And I thought it was a great life lesson because when we're going through difficult times in life, I think the tendency is to duck, to cower, to hide. And the real strong approach is to stick your paddle in, to row, to engage life when life demands to be engaged. Well, I think that stuff is tricky with the past and the future because it's sometimes it's beautiful to think back about the past and we learn from our memories. And you know, it's, it's important to have a vision. That's what makes us human is that we ha are able to imagine the future. I just think that whatever's going on in your life, I think being present is about embracing it, making a part of your experience. Just the weather, for instance. Everyone's always complaining about the weather. It's too hot, it's too cold. You're not gonna do anything by complaining about the weather. Make peace with the weather, as an example. I think uh, it's change the conversation about the past and the future and just awaken to whatever's going on in your life. Wrap your arms around it, stick your paddle in, row. It's the, yeah, it's why everyone's so anxious because we're thinking about the future. Um, the best way that I think I like to explain it, there's an exercise I do, can I do it with you? Where you take your arms to the sides, like this. So this is like, if anyone's never done yoga, I think this is the best way to show yoga instead of the crazy poses on Instagram. So when you hold your arms to the sides like this, at first it feels really simple, and then your shoulders start to burn. And the tendency is we want to avoid 
the sensation. We want to do anything we can to stop feeling this discomfort. And by learning to breathe through the sensation rather than react to it, that's how you dissolve the ego. And we're always feeling something that's uncomfortable. You know, there's always go something going on in our life that makes us want to run or makes us want to be in a moment other than the one we're in. And the most powerful, courageous, loving response is to feel it fully, to breathe through it rather than react to it. So this is going to start to burn any second now. <laughs> so if then you take your arms to the sides and you'll notice how you're more relaxed, your arms are more alive. And that's what happens when we embrace what we're going through rather than kind of react to it. Wayne Dyer said ego is edging God out. Um, you know, like pushing against life instead of relaxing into it. Uh, I think that's a huge part of the yoga practice is, it's so funny because my, I was practicing yoga one time and next to a competitive triathlete and he was sweating his brains out and even the simplest pose was really difficult because he was applying this different philosophy of force, hustle, and effort. And the yogis teach that the way to really move through life is not force, hustle, and effort, but relaxation, letting go, softening. It's, it's about gratitude. It's uh, gratitude. You have to be a badass to be grateful because there's this leading expert on gratitude who said that gratitude is morally and intellectually demanding that it takes mental strength to be able to shift your attention from everything that you need to do or everything that's a mess or everything that hurts and be able to shift your attention to this moment right now and what you do have instead of what you don't. Four hour period, we take 20,000 breaths. And a lot of days go by where we don't pay attention to the sound of even a single breath. And there's nothing more soothing to an anxious, stressed mind than just the, the soothing feeling and sound of the breath. It's like the effect that a mother's voice has on, on the baby. The breath has that on the mind. I met this lady when I lived in New York City. She was the happiest lady I ever met. Um, she was 108 when I met her, and she lived to be 111. And she taught me three lessons on her secrets to happiness. Number one, she was married five times. So that doesn't mean get divorced. It means bounce back. She was knocked down one, two, three, four times and she got up for a fifth marriage. You know, everybody gets knocked down in matters of love, and health, your money, your career. Not everybody gets up. A lot of people stay down. You got to get up. You got to keep trucking. So number one, resilience. Whatever you're going through that's causing your stress, just when you wake up in the morning, make a decision to be stronger than your problems and greater than your circumstances. It's just, it's a state of mind. Uh, number two, the 111 year old lady, the social worker thought she was tired. So he tried to help her lie down and he put his hands on her shoulders to help her li lie back. And she says to him, are you propositioning me? And she had a wicked sense of humor, even at 111. So we're always, everyone's going through something and we all would be so much better off if we could just laugh at our predicaments and smile at our challenges and then when you ask this 111 year old lady what her secrets were how did she do it she did not say oh i'm gluten free she didn't say paleo and <laughs> she didn't say low carb her three secrets three secrets to health and happiness were sex vodka and spicy food and so if you study all of these super centenarians, all these people who are 110 or older, they all have that joie de vivre. They just enjoy life. The oldest lady ever, her name was Jean Calmont. She lived to be 122. She ate two pounds of chocolate every week. Uh, the five oldest people on the planet born in, the last five people born in the 1800s. And they each had something about joy one of them went bowling every day till she was 104. Another one eats barbecue chicken. They try to take it away from her and she tells them to go to hell. Another one drinks homemade brandy every day. But for most people, we put our head on the pillow at the end of the day to go to sleep and like, you don't remember anything that happened. You know, we're all so busy. It's a sociological epidemic that we just plow through the day and we don't take anything with us. And I think the secret to really overcoming stress is 
even if it's just one moment in your day where you really cherish it and you savor it, you ask yourself, what does it taste like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? I think that's the secret that they don't tell you at the doctor's office. Well, I will be the first one to say that yoga teachers are actually the craziest people of all. You could put that on film. <laughs> well, this guy, this shirt I'm wearing, Spiritual Gangster, the, it's, it was a company started by two of my best friends, their husband and wife, and his thing, my, his, his thing is always like, you gotta have more fun. You gotta enjoy yourself. You know, life is a journey and you gotta make sure to enjoy the journey. I mean, I think that's, okay, I was in Alaska and I was went on this amazing camping trip and bald eagles and didn't see another person for three days and my friend said we have to call a taxi to take us back to our car. So he says to me, this taxi driver is gonna have a message for us. I can feel it. It was one of those kinds of trips. And we get in the taxi and the taxi driver, sure enough, he starts telling us the story how he just left hospice and his father passed away. And he said, you know, we were like, I'm so sorry to hear that. And he said, don't be sorry. He said, I got to spend every day with my dad for the last six months of his life. And it was so wonderful. We did all these things. We listened to every pitch of opening day of baseball and we, we caught up on life. And he said, but why did I wait until I was 50? get to know my dad the last six months of his life. Why did I wait? What was I thinking? And so now whenever he meets somebody, he always says in passing, enjoy your journey. Because I think we're all so busy in our minds and focused on our phones and we're forgetting that life is a journey. It's precious. You never know when it's going to end. And make sure you take time each day to enjoy it. Feeling instead of thinking, um, what stirs you emotionally, what makes you feel. I think we get so caught up in our minds, analyzing our lives, um, thinking about what needs to get done over the course of the day. And if it doesn't move you emotionally, I think it's gonna be hard. It's a great question to ask yourself is when you walk into a room, how do you wanna make people feel? What's your emotional signature? And I think we always focus on when you're in a room, you're in a business meeting, it's like, who's the best dressed person? Who's the smartest person? Who's the best looking person? But you can always be the most loving person in the room. You, know, you can always be the kindest person in the room. And when you think in terms of your emotional signature and how you wanna to touch people emotionally, I think then you're in a passionate place. And that's where you need the breathing. Like I was, did that exercise with the arms to the sides. That's where you need to practice instantly going to your breath and having a technique or a tactic that you apply to get through it. Because if you just try to force your way through those really intense emotions, they are, it's paralyzing people. So there's a condition in psychology called your disaster personality, your crisis personality, which states that when you're undergoing intense emotion your personality changes so some people under crisis they actually become heroic calm and cool and very helpful and some people in crisis they lose it and they freak out or they, they're paralyzed so that's where the mind-body practices like yoga and meditation are so useful it's irrelevant if you can wrap your legs around your head but if you can stay calm in a yoga pose and breathe through it you can apply those lessons to real life crises and that's where i think it's important with fear i think i think a lot of times we watch the movies and we think it's going to be this crescendo where we have this moment into the dragon's den and it's over and the rest of your life is beautiful but i think it's actually a daily experience it comes up fear comes up different ways for different people all the time and so it's a daily practice of learning how to make peace with your fear with whatever makes you afraid and learning how to move through it gracefully no i th i think facing your fear is a, it's a daily practice i mean i like baseball it's like in baseball you learn with a sh it's a short hop ground ball you have to get your body in front of it and knock it down and i think it's it's a practice that happens every day and you eventually get better at learning how to move through those moments that 
awaken you, to move through those moments that seem troubling at first. There's a quote that I love, I think it's by Osho. He said, don't seek freedom from life, seek freedom for life. It's a change of perspective. If you're always looking back over your shoulder, wondering what's wrong, uh, talking about what you're afraid of, talking about who's pissing you off, then you perpetuate all those things. But if you change the conversation and talk about what's going well, how you're gonna move through things, who you love, what's beautiful, then you change your perspective on fear. Uh, learning to loosen your grip on life. Um, I think everyone squeezes really tight and we have this, the word perfection is so much a part of American culture. Uh, we want our kids to get the perfect score on a test. We wanna have the perfect presentation in a meeting. We wanna have the perfect game in sports. And I think uh, peace and happiness are hard to come by when the name of the game is perfection. The very best we can do in our lives and as parents, as professionals, is not to be perfect, but to bring the fullness of your attention to the moment you're in and the person you're with. Everybody's so distracted. You know, we're a hundred places at once all the time. And if you can show up fully and be all there for a meeting or be all there for your workout, be all there for your kids. Nobody can ask any more of you than that. And I think that's one of the greatest lessons that I take from the ancient Eastern philosophy is just, and what it really means to be present is just bring 100% of yourself to what you're doing and you're gonna thrive. When you bring 100% of your energy to the moment you're in and the person you're with, you're gonna thrive at work. Uh, you're gonna be great in your relationships. Everything's gonna be, everything's gonna tilt in your favor when you're able to bring all of yourself to your life. I think it's being able to smile. Um, when I lived in New York City, I had moved there and people don't really smile there that easily. So I would, I had a rule that I had, would smile at 10 people before 10 a.m. And you know, New Yorkers would look at you like you'd squirted them in the eye with like breast milk from your man boob. They were so uh, confused by the fact that you're just randomly smiling. But smiling is so powerful. Uh, there was a statistic that the average baby smiles over 200 times a day and the average man smiles only six times each day. So just smiling is so powerful. Um, the quote that I've used in every single yoga class I've ever taught by Thich Nhat Hanh, that sometimes joy is the source of your smile, but sometimes a smile is the source of your joy, which is fake it till you make it. Yeah, I think I find myself a lot of times thinking negatively about other people or other situations, which is human nature, right? How can you not do that? But it's when you can change your thoughts and recognize that your thoughts are powerful like I think Elizabeth Gilbert said you select your thoughts as carefully as you would select your clothes I think that's one of the biggest shifts that we make is to catch yourself when you're thinking negatively about somebody and instead think positively um, it's like kind of like your emotional signature and your thought signature uh, it's like how you define yourself in those subtle ways when someone walks into a room, I think you can tell when they've been thinking negatively and they have a bunch of angry emotions. And you can't get away with that. People feel that at some subtle level. But when someone walks into a room and you can tell that they're thinking positively and they're, they're feeling positively, that you want to be around them. You know, you want to work with them. You want to do business with them. You want to talk to them. You want to touch them. I think sometimes in life it feels like getting out of a rut is going to require a lot of brute force and strength and a lot of times it's just changing your inner dialogue changing the way that you feel and being a force for love and a force for good and it moves people and it changes the situations it alters your health so it's just kind of taking responsibility for your thoughts and your your emotions yeah i mean i think that's one of the biggest things the yogis talk about is that your the most important indication of health is the agility of your spine because if you can move your body as you age you're going to be so much happier 
if you have this amazing physical body but you can't move it, you're gonna freeze up and it's gonna be really awkward and difficult. I think we're most, if you look at pictures of yourself, when you look most attractive is when you're most present, you know, and your energy is all there. That's the most attractive version of you is when the most attractive version of you is when you're fully present in that moment. When you're distracted and your mind is 10 places at once, it's not the most attractive version of you, even if you look the best. And even if you have your nicest clothes on, but you're distracted, it's gonna be hard to connect with people to the extent that you would if you're all there. Start to get a sense of how you're gonna have a handle on the technology, where you're gonna draw the line, because it's only gonna get faster and more efficient, and the devices are only gonna get smaller, and we're approaching what they call the singularity, where you're gonna be one with the machines. It's already happening, you know, you're wearing the watch, and they're, they have the Google Glass, and soon you'll be implanting things inside of you, and if you don't have a personal philosophy about your relationship with technology, then you're just going to become one with your machines. So it's important to have a conversation. I think if you're at the table with somebody and they're on their machine and they're distracted and you don't like it, I think you should take the liberty to say something and ask people to be present with you. You have the right to do that, to ask somebody to be present with you when, when, you're, when you want them to be present with you. You know, it's just a, a common human courtesy to be able to request that of somebody. If Steve Jobs wouldn't let his own kids look at the iPad, uh, that there's something there about that it's not all good for us. I mean, you can't fight the technology companies. They're gonna win. But there's something to be said for humanity and having real human experiences. When a great practice that I mentioned earlier is when you go to sleep at night, being able to put your head on the pillow and have one memory from your day that you cherished. Um, I have a mantra, I call it the BFD mantra, and it's a beautiful, funny, and delicious moment keeps the stress away. That if you have a beautiful moment, a funny moment, and a delicious moment, that's a great day. I think it's the biggest thing. I tend to pig out and scarf down food, and I think everybody does. And to eat, if you just slow it down, and are more present. And the better the food you eat, the more flavor, uh, the more you're likely to appreciate it, the slower you're gonna eat. And when we eat food that's unhealthy, it's not a lot to appreciate. So you wanna eat as much of it as you can, as fast as you can. Um, and I taught this Yoga for Foodies workshop, we talked a lot about the slow food movement. And the guy one of, who started the slow food movement, his name was Carlos Petrini. And he said, some things in life which are crucial to our maturity cannot be sped up and are only possible. Wait, some things in life. Some things in life which are crucial to our maturity cannot be sped up and are only possible if they occur slowly. So certain things like love, like your evolution, your maturity, some things just happen slowly. And I think everybody wants to put their foot on the gas and have as much happen as quickly as possible, and sometimes it just doesn't work like that. A healthy relationship is communication. Being able to go through things together and share and talk about it openly and honestly. I think when you keep things to yourself in a relationship, it makes it really hard to grow. And most, not most, but a lot of people, when you're uncomfortable, you hole up and you keep it to yourself and it's hard to know what the other person's going through. Um, I think relationship, especially a long-term relationship, it's like teamwork. You gotta have the same goals and you gotta work toward those goals and play as a team so there have to be compromises. When it's all about you and your agenda, that's when relationships go awry. So you have to kind of have a sense of where you're going together. I, I think that love moves through the universe like wind or rain. And when your heart is open, it moves through you. And when you're closed off personally, then it's hard to feel love. But I think that it moves through everyone and everything. It's your responsibility. Rumi said, don't seek for love, seek to find and remove the barriers that you've built against love. 
So it's your job as a human being to stay open. It's a vibration, it's a feeling, and by staying open, the greatest tendency in a moment of struggle or fear or stress. You know, it's, there's so much to be said for body language. You know, when you sit slumped over, it means that it's a lack of inner strength or confidence. And when you close off, it shows that you're closed off to the world around you. So I think the biggest thing with love is just to be open, to keep an open heart, um, to stand up, sit up straight, and to be all there. And then you're gonna feel love, it's undeniable. But if you close off and you shrink and you make yourself small, it's harder for love to move through you, it's harder to feel love, and then it will be harder to find relationships or sustain healthy, loving relationships. So it starts with you as an individual and very simply just being open. Wherever you're at in your life, whatever you're going through, embrace it. Wrap your arms around your life. Um, say thank you for your challenges. And that's a hard, that's the hardest question because you want to wrap everything into a neat little bow. <laughs> when I uh, sign my books, I always say, as you know all too well, don't wait, enjoy life now. And I think that's the most important message is just that your life is beautiful. Um, the fact that I think the Buddhists say that just to be born as a human, you've won the lottery. You could be born as like a slug or an ant, but to be able to be a human and have all these experiences, you've already won the lottery and enjoy it.